Hello. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hello. I don't, we can't hear you, but we're so happy you're there. I hope you're all there because <laughs> we can't see you. Welcome to our online program, An Artist Conversation Re Morton. My name is Asuka Kisa, and I am the Director of Learning and Engagement at ICALA. I think most of us now know how this works on Zoom. Uh, this is a webinar platform, so you will only see the speakers and our visuals. Feel free to ask questions in the chat box, and our speakers will try to answer them within a reasonable time frame at the end of the program. So uh, we're doing this now. It is close to the end of the run of this exhibition that we have at the museum. Like all museums, we've been closed since mid-March. And the exhibition we're talking about, Re Morton, The Plant That Heals May Also Poison, had only been open for one month. Uh, it is an exhibition that originated at the Institute of Contemporary Art at the University of Philadelphia, ICA Philly, and was curated by Kate Craxon, who is the curator of the David Winton Bell Gallery at Brown University. This is the first major US presentation of Morton's work in four decades. The artist was born in 1937 and unfortunately suffered an untimely death at age 41 in 1977. Her time making art was brief, but passionate and incredibly productive. The exhibition that fills the galleries at ICALA encompasses a 10 year period of drawings installations, sculptures, paintings, and archives. Uh, sorry, I was looking at the chat. <laughs> Morton produced uh, a philosophically complex body of work, rich in emotion, and though celebrated by peers and younger artists, uh, Morton's influence on contemporary art remains considerably considerable. It's considerable yet muted and her legacy is widely unrecognized, which made this exhibition all the more important. So this was, and it was also very special to bring this exhibition to the West Coast, where her work has rarely been seen. She falls into that esteemed category of an artist's artist, uh, where she continues to inspire those who have discovered her work. Today, we have three LA-based artists who are great fans, and are enthusiastic to have a conversation about Morton's work and legacy. So that would be Jade Gordon, Katie Grinnan, and Evan Holloway. Thank, thank you all for participating in this conversation. And in this conversation will be moderated by Ann Elgood, Good Works Executive Director of the ICALA. So we had to close, uh, we had, we had to be closed. Um, we had to remain closed until the end of the run. We're all very sad about that. We tried to reopen, but it wasn't to be. We did capture the exhibition in three, six, 360 degree, blah, 360 degrees interactive VR, and it can be viewed online even after the end of this run. So we encourage you to do that, check it out. We also have a beautiful exhibition catalog, which can be purchased online in our, on our website. And, and that's about it. We encourage you to stay connected. Oh, thank you, Anne. <laughs> that's what Andy. it looks like. And there are still some left uh, in our inventory. Um, thanks for joining us. Please stay connected, keep going. And now I'm gonna hand it off to Anne Elkin. Thank you, Oscar. Welcome everybody. This is really exciting. Um, I see that, that Kate Craxon is joining us in the ethers. And I just want to congratulate and acknowledge her. This is the curator of the exhibition who initiated the project at ICA Philadelphia. And um, she put together an absolutely extraordinary and very timely and very meaningful exhibition. So congrats to her again, as I've said to her many times <laughs> in the past. There was already a question on the Q&A about whether there was an additional venue. And sadly, ICALA is the final venue on the tour. It started at Philly and then went to the Tang Museum at Skidmore College and now has been here thwarted by the coronavirus, um, but unfortunately is not traveling to another venue. So um, 
we're all sad to see this exhibition close. And as Oscar described, very unfortunately, we haven't been able to reopen it to the public, but there are many programs. The catalog is amazing. The VR capture at least is one way to experience it. So we encourage everyone who has not experienced it in some way to, to really look at this artist and, and her extraordinary work. I'm so thrilled to be joined by Jade Gordon and Katie Grinnan and Evan Holloway, three artists in LA who I admire deeply. And I'm so curious and excited to hear their thoughts on Reed Morton's work, as I'm sure everyone is. And one of the things, there are so many things that I love about Reed Morton's work. And I should just say that I was introduced to her work during my first job as a curator at the New Museum of Contemporary Art in New York, where she had her last survey exhibition, which was now 40 years ago. I was not at the museum at that time, but she was, as some people are very aware, Ree Morton was very close to Marsha Tucker, and Marsha Tucker is the founding director of the New Museum, was, has since passed, and was um, my first mentor in the field of contemporary art. So she, would talk about Re and um, was a, a huge fan as well as a big supporter and friend to Re Morton. And I was aware of the show at the New Museum and always really loved the work, although I had not seen a lot of it in person. And then have seen things here and there. The Drawing Center did a fantastic works on paper show. I don't even remember when. Kate can put that in the chat. <laughs> but. Um, but as many of us, I think, who have known the work for some time and followed it, we really haven't necessarily had a chance to see these amazing objects in person. So, so this, having this show and, and Kate's work uh, to put it together and the scholarship behind it is, is so meaningful. And I hope it's not another 40 years before there's another Re Morton exhibition. But one of the things I really love about Morton's work is how difficult it is to categorize. She's an artist whose work seems to be both inside and outside fully aware of and engaged with the discourses of contemporary art that were happening at, at, during her lifetime and during her career and interested in participating in that discourse while also simultaneously forging wholly new paths and making work that is notably distinct and original. Connie Butler has remarked about Ree Morton's work that it quote doesn't look or act like anything else. And I think the word act in there is really important and that sense of theatricality that her work, much of it embodies will be discussed here today. And then Kate Craxon, the curator has described Morton's work as quote disobedient, a description I really, really love. And I think it's fair to say that I would describe each of you the artists on this panel as similarly making work that's a little difficult to categorize, both engaged very much in the, in the conversations happening in our field, but also very much resisting them in some way too and, and forging your own paths of idiosyncrasy and um, I think really original work. So I, I'm grateful to each of you for being here and Quickly, the format for the conversation, um, I will introduce each of the speakers before they will discuss their particular take on Morton's work for about five to seven minutes. And then we'll have a conversation together. And I have a few questions I may throw out at them um, during that conversation. And then we'll leave about 10 minutes at the end for questions from the audience. And you can post your questions in the Q&A or the chat box. So thanks again for being here. We are going to start with Evan Holloway, who is a native Californian. And Evan describes his hands-on approach to sculpture as a quote, analog counter revolution, a term that I love and that he and I have talked about for a very long time, actually. <laughs> and that um, idea around his own practice evolved when the dominant discourse in art had moved away from presenting objects in space, discrete objects as I like to call them, as a site of aesthetic investigation. Um, I'm not going to do long intros here. I'll just mention that Evan will have a new sculpture on view with David Kordansky titled Rapid and Laughterful beginning on July 29th as part of a one-on-one -on -one viewing platform which takes a single work and discusses it in depth. Evan got his MFA here in LA at UCLA. So over to you, Evan. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Oscar. I'm delighted to have this opportunity 
to talk about Ray Morton. Um, and I don't have much time, so I'm going to try to rip through this. Um, so the technical aspects, the technical aspects of Ray Morton's work are something I'm particularly interested in. The way they contribute to the way the work operates, and also how we see Ray Morton's practice after leaving school, uh, with and the material limitations that she has, and how these limitations are negotiated, um, and also the very special way that she crafts things. Can we move to the first uh, slide, please? So this is souvenir piece. This is maybe this uh, one of the works you see early in the exhibition. Um, and um, one of the things I want to point to really quickly is if you just look at the way uh, in, in the image there, you see the way these pickets are attached. Um, the ones on the corners have screws. The other ones are just leaning against the plywood. Um, so it's really, really casual joinery. And we can wonder how rickety this thing is and how precarious it is. And imagine that. And, the, and what's it made of? You know, it's made out of a piece of plywood, a bunch of one by twos, two colors of house paint, uh, some found wood scraps and some glue. And there's virtually no expense in the materials here, except for the plywood and the paint, and, but it's all hardware store stuff. And it's all made by Ree. And um, the, um, the, if you look at the little things there, like the, the rocks, these are pieces, are, there's a lot to talk about in the content of this work. But these are, are bits that were found on a family vacation that were picked up by, by Re and her children, and as well as some wood scraps. And, and so there's a kind of an animistic quality to the way these things are handled. If you look at the way that little bit of um, where that two by four had been failed to, it, it, it was not cut through entirely and properly. So there's a little bit jutting out. And then these little bits are glued together. Uh, it's really just wood glue, a little bit of drilling and doweling, a little bit of sanding, um, that, that little rock that looks like a foot sticking out from underneath that, that small chunk of log. I love that kind of animism in, in the work. And um, one of the things about this is that it's, um, it, the, the Rees work doesn't really, this is a presentation of, of a number of little things. It's, it's not, it doesn't have a dominant form. It's not a big shape in space. It's like an arrangement uh, of, of things. Can we move on to the next slide? Oh, sorry. Oh. Uh, there in the background, we see the, um, uh, the uh, wood drawings. Can we, uh, the wall drawings. Can we move to those from 1971? Uh, the next, uh, next image, please. Yes. Okay, so th this work actually is about two years before the work we just discussed. And at this point, there are even fewer tools employed. Okay, so the first one, we had wood, sandpaper, uh, one of the, uh, the, and um, it, here, this is literally just wood scraps that are found and um, some pin marks. And I would expect maybe just hardware that you could purchase with nickels and dimes if you just didn't find it. You could literally, there's, there's virtually no expense uh, to this piece. And so the, the limitations are just exquisite. Um, and um, so if you, I picked this particular piece for a detail there because you see, it's a two by four that's got a bevel in it that was obviously cut by a table saw. Now I'm certain Ree Morton doesn't own a table saw at this point. Uh, it's, <laughs> and so she picks up this piece, these scraps from somewhere and, and, that, and, and all of them have, have you know, it, it, well, but it's kind of an industrial looking scrap. It's a special little cut there. And, and if you look at the way it's been put together, to, to me it sort of answers this question like, what if you wanted to make sculpture in the late 60s or the early 70s, but you couldn't hire an industrial fabricator? You know, this thing to me, if you look at the line marks in it, which are, there's a, a set of line marks that go along it, it has this seriality in it that to me reminds me of a Donald Judd. But this is, you know, this is completely homemade garage and a screwdriver. Um, minimalism. And so it picks up this flavor of um, through its limitations. Um, and much of the work, what carries through are these meaningful juxtapositions that, that happen as a result of, 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 uh, of the limitations. Can we move to the next slide? Okay, here, uh, I, there's a one, one of these things is not from the wall drawings. 
Uh, it's kind of an image in the lower center there. This is a little chiseled part of a piece called Seesaw. Now what's funny about this is it, it's a piece of uh, two by 12 that's been chiseled at and then at a later moment attached. So there's like two work sessions in this at least and they weren't from a master plan. You wouldn't, I mean, maybe, but it seems unlikely that you would set out and say, I'm gonna chisel this and then attach it to a thing in an entirely casual way, although it's doweled, uh, but, but not, you know, without, there's no, basically there's no tooling on that red, um, on that red plank. So, you know, what, what I like about this work, one of the things is, is that there are things that are like, this I worked on, this I didn't work on. And, and there are things that are hasty in the work, and then there are things that are very patient. And you have a sense of what it took to make every move. And um, you can see the, um, the development of Rhee's practice as she has to work on her own with no money, and as she acquires tools and access to materials. Starts with 1970, uh, the wall piece with virtually nothing. You can very clearly tell when Rhee gets a jigsaw in later works. And then you can also see when the Scholastic arrives. And um, so um, anyway, uh, that is part of the charm uh, of this work. Um, just the way uh, these limitations define it and what emerges in the craft of these things as, as you move through Rhee's body of work. I believe I might be out of time. Perfect timing, Evan. Thanks. Thank you. Next is Katie Grinnan, who is from Richmond, Virginia, originally. Katie creates works that stem from the body, exploring the relationship between visual, kinesthetic, and cognitive experience. Most recently, her focus has incorporated various states of consciousness, such as meditation and dreaming. Katie also received her MFA from UCLA and attended the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture. Katie. Katie, you're muted. Katie appears to be frozen. frozen. We've, <laughs> we've lost her. <laughs> oh no. The perils of Zoom. Okay, she's probably going to try to log back in. Let's give her one second. If not, we'll move on to Jade. And she can join. There she is. We lost you. Zoom. <laughs> okay, she's back. Okay. Take it uh, away. All right. Um, so uh, I wanted to focus on Ree Morton's relationship to movement, notation, and gesture. Um, and so I made a list, um, which seems sort of appropriate when talking about Re, and it sort of helped me organize my thoughts. And um, I think I'll create an atmosphere to think through. So I'm going to read it. Um, motion, emotion, moving, being moved, implied motion, potential energy, precarity, vulnerability, at the still point of the turning world, at the still point, there the dance is, rhythm, intervals, components of a system, segments of life, notation, marking, demarcating, gaming, mapping, coding, diagramming possible paths, paths traveled and experienced, Pass back to memories, collecting, arranging, celebrating, animating, deanimating, vibrancy, gesturing, gesticulating, taunt, flaunt, contradicting, communicating, connecting, caring, healing, signs of love. Um, so driving on my way back from the ICA, I was mesmerized by the cadence of the dotted lines on the highway, thinking about re and her influence of construction markings and use of dotted lines and map to map paths, routes, suggested areas, interiors, or places. Um, that the dotted line was porous and provisional. Um, this became a form of notation that would scale in her work. Um, but there are lots of rhythms and intervals in her work. 
And she was looking at archaeological sites and architectural drawings, but I also associate it with notations of dance, direction, and choreography, like Yvonne Rayner's notation and language and the language strategies of conceptualism. Although she's not associated with conceptualism because of her irreverent aesthetics, poetics, humor, playfulness, and leaning into the personal. Um, so souvenir piece, um, which was inspired by a summer in, the Newfoundland, in Newfoundland, Canada, a trip that she went to with her three kids is often framed by the backstory that it was the happiest summer of her life. Um, the rocks and the odd specific collection of elements seem to map the relationship to walks in the landscape. They make me think about rocks that mark trails or hikes, ancient land markers, and they also seem to mark the memories of the experiences with her family there. The rocks and drawings could be seen as mapping characters, her kids and the landscape as well. The table's low at child height. Height could be seen as a time marker, thinking about youth or innocence, but also landscape and horizon lines. Using strategies of archiving and cryptic museum display, Drawings seem to map and diagram a set of abstract relationships. The data notation system, intervals, color, and fascinating character of the elements create a reality that can be felt or pondered. But the provisional quality and the way it mimics relics doesn't really allow for entry into the experiential or emotional realm. And maybe parsing that loss and impossibility of that translates translation creates the stillness or lack of motion and deadness. Even though I get a lot of pleasure in imagining and pondering the abstraction and the objects on their own terms. This law has a similar scaling when you read it through multiple vantage points simultaneously. Oh, next slide, thanks. <laughs> um, though um, through that, you can also read different relationships to time, motion, and interval. It sits like a tool of measurement or navigation, mapping like a compass, direction as a sense of time, or a playground, age as a sense of time, or family time, thinking about implied social dimensions, or larger time scales. At the still point of the turning world, a phrase from a T.S. Eliot poem that's associated with this work. This phrase makes me think about the North Star Polaris, which appears to remain fixed from our vantage point on Earth because the Earth's rotation, because of the Earth's rotation, but the fixed quality is an illusion of perspective. We just experience it that way from our position in space. So the mobility implied by the handle um, in the sculpture seems really important, that you could pack up and move the center and that there's no real center, a kind of weight. I, I kind of weight her biography heavily when thinking about moving the center. You make your family community wherever you are, or you can take your memories or an idea with you. Um, Untitled Line series, next slide, has a zoomed in vantage point, like looking through a microscope. I think about our time as a nurse with this piece, looking at the body through the lens of an objective scientist, but also as a caregiver. Reading about her as a young child watching ant hills and pr protecting ladybugs. To me, the perspective and line quality seems really intimate, like looking at another person's insides or selves. There's a delicacy to the drawing, the branching network of lines, almost mimicking the act of cracking. Her touch is all over this, and it feels like a vulnerable surface. But I can flip that and read a kind of vigorous animation and mutability in the lines. I love her idea of the mating habits of lines, which seems hilarious. Thinking about it that way makes me think of mapping a strange choreography happening at the molecular level of the body, like a moving parade of chromosomes. But she also carried that pattern over into the drawings about plants and weeds. So it was an investigation of lots of living things and organisms. Um, next slide. Then she discovers Celastic, and the movement changes in her work, leaning into what the material can do. I can relate to how life-changing that discovery was because that was my own experience with Friendly Plastic, which works in a similar way in terms of working time to the Celastic. 
But the fast working time of these materials gives it the, the ability to create gravity defying forms that other materials can't achieve. All of a sudden, the material could perform like a kind, and the kind of gestures that could be explored opened up. Motions seemingly carried by air or wind, skipping, twirling, dancing. The work has an exuberance and a taunting quality too. Sometimes I wear a lavender sweatshirt with pink hearts to school, and it's like a game as a five foot female sculpture teacher <laughs> to see if I can pull that off, off being taken seriously through my words in that outfit. And I feel like that is a formal exercise that's happening in her work at this time. She leans into cliches or romanticism. It's funny though, as much as the gestures of the materials have a performative affect of celebratory action, the words are often more foreboding. Let us celebrate while youth lingers and ideas flow. Or don't worry, I'll only read you the good parts. The gap or absence found in souvenir piece is still there, thinking about the mental action behind the scenes that is left to be filled in and remains incomplete. The off obfuscation of the provisional gaming in the early work kind of, kind of gives way to a projected gestural reality play in some of this later work. Sometimes the screen seems to act as a shield to protect from harsher realities. Sometimes it also seems to perform the act of self-preservation. Her work seems like good medicine when I see it. That's it. Thank you, Katie. So much to think about there. We will come back to many of those ideas, I think. And lastly, we have Jade Gordon, who is also a native Californian and a founding member of the art collective My Barbarian. She also has a concurrent collaboration practice with Megan Whitmarsh and throughout her practice has created videos, performances, installation and events and uh, oftentimes engages the community. Her collaborative work uses performance to theatricalize social problems and imagine ways of being together. Jade and Megan have an exhibition at Over the Influence and at UNLV, uh, both scheduled currently for two 2021. And then My Barbarian will have a 20 year survey of their work at the Whitney Museum of American Art, also scheduled for 2021, something that makes me extremely happy. I am so excited for that. And um, Jade, received an MA in Applied Theater Arts from USC and is a practitioner of Theater of the Oppressed Techniques. So Jade. Hello, thank you so much for including me. Um, I wanted to talk about theatricality in Ree Morton's work and her connection to experimental theater. So Ree Morton was interested in Polish theater director Jerzy Grotowski's concept of a poor theater. And poor theater is stripped of, of everything that's not essential to it. It's a distillation of signs and gestures. Um, it's not about an accumulation of realistic behaviors, but rather a subtraction. The audience actor relationship is emphasized with the goal being a real time shared psychologically transformative experience. Uh, Grotowski believed that theater should be ritual, that words are symbols, and that there should be a confrontation of myth rather than an identification with it. So Ree Morton played with these ideas, uh, as well as other types of theatricality. Uh, she learned about Scholastic from a Broadway set designer friend and used it to fashion Baroque inspired proscenium like curtains for her regional piece in 1975 and 1976. Um, in her installation to each concrete man in 1974, she used theatrical lighting and immersive multifocal perspectives, similar to what uh, Richard Schechner and the performance group were doing in the late 60s with their environmental theater productions, creating multiple points of entry, multiple uh, 
points of focus, uh, the audience members might have a completely different uh, understanding of a performance depending on where they were in the room. And, I, and with this installation, that might be true as well with the viewer. First, next slide. So, uh, in 1977, uh, Ree Morton collaborated with a theater troupe called Mabu Mines. Uh, they were formed in 1970, and members of the company had worked in Europe with Grotowski and had incorporated his ideas into their productions. So they placed words and imagery on equal footing actors in the performances existed as sculpted forms or objects. Humans were doers rather than characters. They weren't performing, but they were um, rather carrying out tasks. Uh, Mabu Mines was, was known as a painter's theater, and they frequently collaborated with visual artists. And they were able to bridge the audiences of performance art and happenings with uh, audiences, theater audiences, traditional theater audiences. So she collaborated with them on a production in 1977 called uh, Dressed Like an Egg. It was based on the writings of Colette. And a New York Times review at the time said it was an attempt to reintegrate into the group's work a lush, multicolored theatricality that performance art had eschewed in the name of modernist purity. So that impulse was similar to Morton's response to minimalism, I think. Um, Nancy Graves, artist Nancy Graves, also contributed to the production. She designed an, a, an enormous gliding backdrop that drifted through the performance space at the rate of one foot per minute. And founding member, one of the founding members of Mabu Minds, Philip Glass, did the score. So for the production, Morton made uh, several costume pieces out of Celastic. She made two sculpted impressions of billowing scarves, which could be seen as frozen, formalized romanticism. Uh, she made a Colette dress uh, as well that the actor wearing could literally step in and out of during the performance. So in, uh, in theater, um, there's a word, a Greek word called metaxis, and Augusta Boal, uh, in his book, The Theater of the Oppressed, talks about this word. Um, and it means an in-betweenness. It's a state of, of being fully immersed in two worlds simultaneously. So it's kind of similar to Brecht's alienation effect, but it differs in that it lets you completely feel something and completely judge something at the same time. Um, and so I think with Ree Morton's work, um, metaxis allows for emotion and sentiment to be present in the work, but also carves out a space for humor and criticality. So next slide. So, um, in, in Signs of Love from 1976, she, were, she uses words uh, such as atmospheres, gestures, moments, pleasures, objects, or, or pose. And this is all theatrical language. It's like a big carnival. And this installation is a, a critical performance of the position of naivete conjuring fairy tales and melodramatic romantic love, but she and we are really feeling it also at the same time. So we're performing the position, but feeling all of the feelings that you feel with love and romantic melodrama. With uh, Maid of the Mist on the right, uh, this was a, a performance she did in Lewiston, New York at Niagara Falls. It's right on the border of Canada uh, and, and New York. Um, it, it was a, a performed public ritual 
a symbolic melodramatic rescue based on the famous Iroquois legend of the bereaved suicidal maiden who sacrificed herself over the falls in a canoe after her husband's death. So again, we can see one of Grotowski's ideas here, which is the confrontation of myth rather than an identification with it. And this rescue was a feminist correction of that myth. Um, I think also the ladder and the ribbons could uh, be a, a nod, a possible nod to Victorian melodramatic pageantry, like the well-publicized barrel stunts that crazy people did in the early 1900s, throwing themselves over the falls as a way to get famous. So we had the audience arranged in outdoor theater seats, and she said that her intention was to, quote, increase the dramatic quality already present at the site, though it seems to me that it doesn't really get more dramatic than Niagara Falls, so. Thank you, Jade. That was fantastic. So I wanted to first open it up. Maybe, Oscar, maybe let's go to the next slide. We just have a few installation images from the show that we can ponder while we talk. Thank you all. So much food for thought. Um, I wanted to just begin by seeing if you have questions for each other that grew out of your comments, if, if there's any subject that came up that you want to unpack a little bit more together. Jade, yeah. I had a, I just wanted to talk about, or I had two questions, one question for Evan and one question for Katie. Perfect. Uh, so one of the things I was thinking about a little bit in terms of materials, um, uh, when I was looking at um, like poor theater and, and her work was just the poverty of materials and her, like what we were talking about in the beginning of your presentation, the wood scraps and found materials. And so I was, I was making the connection of like poor theater stripped down uh, and the, the poverty of the materials. Um, and then also this idea of um, availableism, which is something Alex and Malik and I talk about a lot, but also I know Vaginal Davis is, talks a lot about this, but it's, again, it's a kind of poor theater, a different kind of poverty maybe, where you just kind of find stuff that is around because you're poor. But I'm just wondering like how you think about, how, how you work with materials, and I know that you work a little with aqua resin, and I, I sometimes use aqua resin with masks. And, and then Katie, I was really curious about, um, I'm just very curious about friendly plastic. The name alone is kind of amazing, but if you could kind of describe how that works um, at some point, that'd be, I'd just like to kind of pick your brain a lot about that too. I think one of the reasons I have an affinity for the early work of Brie and actually the, um, the whole body of work is that I relate to the uh, struggle to um, make things. Uh, I was talking to a young artist recently who is making very interesting work, but doesn't have a studio. So that means that she's making work with plaster and fiberglass in her apartment. And that is an undertaking, you know, <laughs> if you want to get your cleaning deposit back. And um, there's things about the, um, the, the wood drawings, which, which, you know, the work that's from the, the, from school before that, before she's thrown out on her own, it so much reminds me of that moment that so many people undergo when they're thrown away from an institution that has tools and materials. And um, now you've got to fend for yourself and you've got no space and no money. And um, so that, uh, th that's just something that's always attracted me about the work and seeing and literally just tracking how, you know, how these things enter in, in one at a time. You know. It's like being thrown out of the foster system, the, the studio in school. Well, I don't know if it's quite so traumatic, but yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's been interesting during, I mean, during COVID, it's, it's been a strange time teaching in particular because it's, because a lot of people are making work from home and, there's a really limited amount of space oftentimes and, and 
limited amount of um, work area, tools, all of that, that stuff. And so it's kind of like there, you're almost on like a guided tour of what that moment is like in that transition to when you are out of school in a lot of ways. But um, I don't know, I think that's really, really meaningful to think about right now um, because of like the space that that a lot of people have right now. Um, but, and the friendly plastic is, um, is a really, I, I love this material and it was kind of life altering for me. Um, it's expensive. A lot of times I do get it donated actually. And um, if there's students out there like listening that you can sometimes call a company up and ask them to donate stuff. And sometimes they do. Um, and that's, that's a kind of exciting thing. And that's, that's how I got my hands on friendly plastic at first, um, was that they donated it to me, but, um, but it's, you can, it comes in pellet form and you can dip it in water. It's a thermal plastic. And then you can sort of, um, and then it kind of turns to like a clear clay in a way and you can work it. It's so similar to the celastic, I think, except you can sand the celastic, but, um, but it, it's workable for like 20 minutes and then you can, um, but you can reheat it with a heat gun and then you can fuse it to, back to itself. So it's different than ceramics because you can fuse it to itself and you can run it through a bandsaw you can take a jigsaw to it or um, a sawzall and cut it and fuse it back together. So it works like Photoshop. So I could, I could really relate to the kind of like speed that she was sort of talking about that was like sort of a necessity in her work um, to get some of the effects that she wanted because the, the friendly plastic sort of behaves in a similar way. Um, and so, um, yeah, and with my students, a lot of them are going to have kits of it to sort of experiment with it. So I could really relate to um, the piece that she made with her students where you're sort of like all sort of trying to like figure things out together or figure out new ways of using it and stuff. It's fun. Is it, is it friendly because it's easy or because it's non-toxic? It's because it's... I, it's pretty non-toxic as far as I can tell. It's like a, I mean, I've gotten the specs on it and it's like a, it's kind of akin to like a polyethylene. Um, it's a kid's material. So a lot of, um, it's made by the American Art and Clay Company, but it's like, um, but, it, but a lot of kids use it. And that was also kind of an attractive thing because it was sort of like, kind of easy. It's, it was like, it was kind of the, it was a really easy, immediate way to make something. You just like can push something into a mold. If you want, you could stretch it like gum. You can do all these different things with it. It's super, I, I mean, it's magic. Let me just interject something on that point. I think two things that you've just said. Um, one is the, the idea of children's materials or craft materials, which I think we see in Ree's work, certainly in the case of using glitter or something, you almost feel like she literally stole it from her children's craft um, container. Uh, and then on the subject of teaching, you know, Ree taught quite a bit. And one of the reasons that she was so peripatetic was she was moving from teaching different places. And I wanna point out um, on the image that we're looking at right now on the left side and the back, where you see the kind of horseshoe shaped elements, that piece grew out of working with her students. And it's a piece for a summer she spent teaching in Bozeman, Montana. Somebody actually put a question in the chat whether it grew out of an idea of Montana or her experience there. And in fact, she did teach there and spent the summer. And then the piece, which you can't see in detail here, um, has the names of all of her students that are put into the celastic material, the horseshoe shapes, and then references to fishing and drinking beer and all of the very Montana um, experiences that she was enjoying during that summer. Um, I wanna shift us back and ask a question um, to 
all of you and anyone can chime in, but I was hoping we could unpack a little bit each of your thinking about the balance that Morton strikes between her formal investigations of materiality, uh, the, the aspects of sculpture like balance, um, movement, some of the qualities that you've all been describing and the discourses of the contemporary art world at that time in the 1970s that she was very familiar with and, and balancing that with her desire to include personal experience and um, sentimentality and some of the more emotive qualities that you've also been describing into the work and a, which oftentimes brought a kind of idiosyncrasy to her objects. And does anyone want to want to speak to that? Because I'm always struck by the way that she's she manages to do both of those things, where I think a lot of artists in that time were maybe, you know, lean, leaned more heavily one way or the other. And perhaps in her work, once she learns of Celastic and starts to use it, we see more of that theatricality. But I think in pieces like Seesaw and others that you've described, we we also do see inklings of that earlier on. Any thoughts on that? That was kind of a very long-winded question. Um, I can, well, I mean, in thinking about Seesaw or, or, or thinking about um, souvenir piece, that, I mean, it's interesting because that in those, pieces there's a kind of cryptic quality to the personal in a lot of ways that um and i'm even i've been thinking about that in terms of like the piece that you just described with her students like other than their names in a lot of ways that it's it's kind of um it's kind of frontal in a way you know that's that there's kind of not that much given in terms of like ex experience. So there's a, but there's a, there is a kind of tenderness to the handling of things that I think you can, you can, I mean, it's almost through the form that I read, like the kind of care or personal or, um, or handling like the kind of intimacy, I guess is how I relate to it. Um, I don't know. I mean, it, yeah, what do you guys think? It, it almost seems like she has these distilled messages to people that, so the, the words become kind of, uh, as if you had a letter to a, 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 a loved one and you chose just random words out of it. So it was like distilled to like the meaning of those words. I, I, I think with the piece, um, I'll only read you the good parts. I had a really, um, I had a really. Do you want to strong, show that image? Sorry to interrupt you. I, I had a really emotional uh, response to this. Um, I, like I projected a lot onto it, and it's because of this um, uh, absence of specificity, I think. But it also evokes all of these different kinds of relationships for me. I, I look at this and I think, oh, well, this is me talking to my my child and sort of being protective of them. But it's also a little bit um, me talking to the art world about, and not sharing information about my children or, you know, I, you know, only talking about the good parts of my life or, you know, or even just like a, a, a narrative, a tr like a life's narrative, like, oh, you know, I had this tragedy in my life, but don't worry, I'll only share the good parts with you because I only want to project that. And even with her own life, right, and, and tragic end, it's don't worry, I'll only read you the good parts, which are, which is really the art. And then it talks, then it really opens up this conversation about like what's valuable, you know, is personal experience valuable or is only production and that kind of like masculine production in the art world is that the only thing that's important? So just, it holds so much, but it also feels a little bit like she was um, a rebellious and kind of wanted to uh, reclaim um, bad taste and kind of like t 
trashiness a little bit. And maybe in the same way Merle uh, Ukelis reclaimed motherhood and maintenance work as art, she's saying, well, I'm going to kind of reclaim trashy kitsch theatricality, and that's going to be art. So it's sort of a, just a, she's saying, you know, maybe, maybe it's about multiple points of entry for the world or maybe it's just about valuing things that aren't valuable yeah i also kind of felt like um there's there's a quality of her work that's kind of i mean this piece like hits me too and and it's sort of um like there's a kind of masquerade or like putting on your your best like face or something like that to the world and then it's like there's all this sort of struggle or whatever that it seems like it's like un you know you fill in the blanks on what that is but you kind of you kind of know what's underneath um possibly or, you know and and that's the that's the part that's really um that I, I, where I think it kind of creates this, the like, gap creates this kind of longing or like um, to, to finish it and the fact that it, it, it's like, you kind of know there's maybe some pain, like, like there seems like there's a lot of pain behind that. It's an invitation for the viewer to also kind of feel a little bit of, you know, fill in the gaps, like you said. Well, you can yeah. be on the side of this piece. You can either be read to or the reader, right. you know. Um, it's very interesting what you say about the um, anonymity of some of this, even though those are, those are specific names, you know, there is just enough to touch in these things to where it's familiar, but it's not, um, it's not too specific, actually. That's a very interesting point about the work. I think That's a lot of artists, we're working with things that were, you know, I was thinking about like, um, oh, Dennis Oppenheim or uh, Linda Montano, uh, John Duncan, <laughs> other people were doing things that, that were extremely personal at the time, but there's a very special way that the way, in, in the way, special handling in, in the way that Dream Morton uh, handles uh, emotion and sentimentality. It also seems to me that she's always referencing or pointing to the idea of community and, and yet not in this insular way in which you feel left out if you aren't part of that community. I mean, of course, we're looking at it decades yeah. later and wouldn't have been, but she's talking about relationships. She's talking about, as you say, Evan, being being read to or, or being, you know, the reader or the person being read to. The flags that we saw in the earlier piece, each one is based on a particular person in her life and a and is a, a an emblem to them in some sense. And you and even and the Bozeman piece, as you're all saying, of course, we don't have real access to that particular community of her life that summer. We don't know who those people are and it, it doesn't really matter. It's more about, it's not about the fact that you weren't there and you missed out. It's just this um, belief and commitment that she has to community and to others and to the relational aspects of our lives that she might somehow be able to um, give us a glimpse of in, in a very uh, personal and sentimental way. And I think that that's such a lesson to us right now. I think part of what you're responding to, Jade, in a piece like this is that everything is so fraught right now. And this is a very kind and almost selfless piece that's super complicated in, in the ways you're describing. But just the phrase, don't worry right now, almost makes me want to like burst into tears because that's all we're doing right now. We're all collectively worrying all the time. And the, the anxiety that we're all living with is so profound. So I'm sure that also had something to do with it. I do want to open it up to the audience, but I'm just going to quickly pose one more question, which you don't all have to respond to, but it's a, a provocation, um, which is, you know, as we well know, this is an artist who, while we are very lucky that she was so productive in the decade of her making, um, you know, died in 1977 and I always think about artists who left us too soon and what they might be doing now if they were still with us. So any thoughts on what you think Ree Morton would be up to these days? No. Um, <laughs> I, well, I think that here's the thing is that um, Reese obviously was a super interesting person with a lot of diverse interests. And, you know, you see in the work, um, well, there's a piece that, that I like 
that's kind of obscure that it's just a drying rack for green beans. Um, but then there's also, um, you know, there's this theatrical thing, there's sculpture, there's installation, there's painting. And, you know, she'd been a nurse, she'd been a mother. There's no reason to assume she'd stay an artist, you know? So uh, I think that's a little presumptuous on our part. I think, I think the, the dynamic, uh, <laughs> you know, genius of, of Reed Morton, we, we have no idea where it would have led. Uh, I don't know, maybe she'd be making a mask right now, a nice mask. <laughs> I hope she'd be making masks and performances. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it seems definitely like the materials would have guided where she went, right? So maybe she would have discovered some other kind of mm -hmm. elastic type revolution, you know, and, and, and mm -hmm. gone off on a whole other tangent with that. Yeah. Very likely. <laughs> Katie, any last thoughts before we open it up to, for questions? Well, I mean, another thing that seemed like it was getting ready to happen was that she wasn't going to be moving around as much. So I wonder what sort of a more static re um, would would make, you know, like I, I, don't, I, I don't I can't even imagine. But, you know, like a, so much of the work seems like it's kind of based on um, her kind of moving around too in a lot of ways and sort of getting these new experiences. So I kind of wonder what she would make if she was fixed a little bit, you know, like, or at least in, in her location, you know, so I, I, I don't know. That seems like it would have something to do with the work. Cause I think so much of it's about this kind of movement um, on so many different levels. Right, so true. So I see one question in the chat, and then Asuka, I think there maybe were some hands raised at some point. So I'll ask this first question from Nzuji. And she, I'm going to distill her question, but she's noticing the childlike quality of some of the work. And she describes the work as feeling almost unfinished on purpose and a little bit messy and imperfect. And she's wondering what, how you all read that. Is this, a, what is, is she embracing imperfection, the imperfections of life? Is there a childlike quality that she's interested in? Any thoughts on that? I have just, one thing I read was that, or I, I think I saw it in a, a clip of the, the video uh, from 1974, the interview, where she was talking about how she, um, had to work really quickly because she had all of these ideas uh, and I, I was thinking about her I was thinking about this time in COVID for me as a time where I literally can't do very much because I've got to take care of my kids and I can't leave the house but I have all these ideas percolating and all this energy building and I'm trying to appreciate that so I'm imagining the time that she spent you know just being a housewife and, and a mom as this time where all of this psychic creative energy was building almost like a boiling pot and then she's the the lid is taken off the pot when she's finally frees herself in a sense and goes to art school so I, I think it's just a matter of like how can I work really fast and sloppy and get this stuff out and also how do I make work that's not going to be like wrecked if my kids step on it or you know bump into it like how can I just it's almost like she's not precious about the material or the, like the objects, but more, it's more about like working through these, these rushing ideas. Yeah, I think the velocity of the, of the work, you know, the, the sense of how, how rapidly um, uh, it moves through the hand, you know, from the mind and through the hand and also the interaction with, with the particular material and, and how, how that presents an exciting um, interaction, like that um, animistic quality, you know, that we see uh, in even in like the little way that the uh, Newfoundland little objects are stacked to make like little, they're like little personages. And, um, you know, I think as soon as like the, a little bit of the, the personality of the, of the meeting of, of the kind of, uh, of, tooling or not tooling or mark or not mark, as soon as that personality emerges, it's just left, it's left, you know? And that's, that's so much of the working area rather than, than achieving a perfected form. 
it's in a, it's a dynamic um, relationship with the objects and and uh, that's that, that's part of uh, and that, that that's still what's so exciting about the work is that you know even though a particular uh, action was taken uh, you know 40 years ago or more you still have a really great sense of how this thing met this thing <laughs> and and you wouldn't have that if it had a um, a, a perfect finish, you know, if it, it, you, you wouldn't have any sense of that at all. Yeah, I think like the, the time factor and also this kind of provisional attitude. I mean, I don't know, um, like where it seemed like she would like make something at least early on, it seemed like that kind of got into the work where she would make something and then try something out and then it would and set something up and then she'd do it a different way. And she almost made these like notations of how those setups would happen. And that seemed to me sort of like, um, like it didn't seem like the work was about being at rest. And in a weird way, I think that makes for maybe something to appear unfinished, but I don't even think, fin yeah, like what, um, what you're saying, Evan, too, like I don't think finish was the work. Oops. Uh oh. You're still here. Oh, oh I good. am. <laughs> that no, was funny. Zoom just popped up. I'm having some real like Zoom issues. <laughs> but um <laughs> but anyway, yeah, like that um that that like perfection wasn't really like a a, a something she aspired to. Yeah, I read she would take part, take things apart and rebuild them. And so it almost becomes like their little, I mean, I was thinking about in terms of props, like the like bits of the sculptures become props and the different sets that she's building um, mm -hmm. and things are sort of moved through and, and recycled. Oh, what, what's those pieces, you know, where it's like a four by four and those log circles and some sand. There's like eight pieces that are made out of that same arrangement, yeah. you know, just, just moved around over and over. I don't. I don't know if it has a title. And then it connects yeah. everything. Yeah. yeah. Is it like this? A couple of hands raised. Yeah. Can we yeah, go to? <laughs> <laughs> See, we've all got our catalogs handy. Um, I know. I can, you know, Evan uh, gave me this catalog back in the day. I just wanted to, because like, what a gift. I wow, mean, no kidding. That's a rare find now. It was, it, I mean, yeah, it was really like, so Oscar's gonna uh, let can, somebody speak. I can allow speak. people to speak. I have three hands. There are three hands up. So Christine McPhee, I'm gonna let you to to speak. I don't know if I can see you, but oh, we can. She just popped up. Oh, great. Hi. Um, I just I really would love for people to to continue to. Um, talk about this kind of quality of the provisional of the of the I guess sometimes in spiritual studies it's called the via negativa or the way a path that's um, not, a, not a positive path that it might be and that it, it is something that is um, not um, it, I, I can't really think of a way of describing it other than the provisionality of it maybe just anyone Jay, maybe jade riffing on that a little bit more and perhaps in connection with the idea of the poor theater and re well yeah maybe i'm maybe i'm i'm um misunderstanding via negative but is it something like a negative capability where you kind of move toward something and, tr and toward the creative and toward the sort of generative even though by moving in that direction, it puts you in a place of kind of confusion and, and not knowing what's going to happen. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So do you, do you think that's, uh, makes, uh, is that, is that something that's typical? Do you think that that's a functionality within Ree's connection to poor theater in a way to the, to form the performative aspects of, of her work? I think in terms of, I think there's a lot of different kinds of theater, theatricality and, and mm -hmm. in, in her work and different kinds of performance in the work. And I think she's mm -hmm. sort of exploring all of that. But I think specifically to 
to Grotowski and the, and the poor theater. I, I think his main, the main idea with that is sort of having an impulse and having a reaction and having another impulse and just seeing sort of where that leads you. So in his plastiques, in the exercises, if you can, you can look it up on the internet, they're really kind of amazing to watch. But there's uh, two actors will be um, together working in a, in a gym and one will touch a, a, a point on the other person's body and that person might not know they might know not know anything about this scene or what's happening, but there's a there's an impulse uh, and then a reaction and an impulse and reaction. So maybe when the way she sort of takes things apart and finds things and repurposes things and puts them back together, maybe it's maybe she's sort of responding to that idea of like impulse, reaction, discovery, moving into the unknown and really kind of connecting with the archetypal and the and the and the universal unconscious, you know? Right. Can we uh, let somebody else ask their question to Oscar? We have two more hands up, so we're gonna let each of them. Okay, I'm going in order. Thank you, Christina, Xi, for that. Xi Chong. Just gonna close my door because my children are home. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Xi Chong, are you there? Xi you want to ask your question? You might have your microphone off. Um, yeah. Actually, I think that's what's. You might have to unmute. Yourself. You can like unmute on the side, um, in the lower left corner. Hmm. Okay. Chong, you can also add it to the chat if you know how to do that, and we can read out your question for you. She, you want to go to Frank? Yeah, I'll go to Frank. Should be able to talk, Frank. Sometimes the host mutes can mute and unmute people. Oh, Frank, Frank's unmuted. Uh, mm -hmm. Frank, do you want to ask your question? This is very mysterious <laughs> situation. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, any more questions? No? New question. Okay, here we go. And Zuji is saying technology dot dot dot. Indeed. <laughs> I don't know if Ree would be into it. All right. <laughs> Well, I guess that's it. I don't know. Any I'm last? Um, sorry, Su Chong and Frank, we're not able to hear you if you're if you're asking your question. Um, Katie, Jade, Evan, any last comments, thoughts, parting words? Thank you for your insights. It's always really uh, hearing artists talk about other artists' work is always incredibly powerful and meaningful. So I appreciate it and I'm sure others do. Do you have any last words or thoughts? Well, this is really a lucky meeting, you know, to, to have this opportunity. I really, uh, I think, um, you know, we all have our, our own ways of looking at this work. We all see the same thing, but then the, the things that we extract from it are very, you know, it's a real testament to the depth of the work and uh, how much it can give uh, to all of us. And uh, so it was really, really great. I, I think uh, th things I, I, I heard from both of you, I'm, I'm really gonna, uh, gonna think about those things as I go back through my texts and my images of, uh, of Reed Morton stuff. So thank you both. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for including me and, and Evan and, and Katie. I hope that we can uh, someday meet in, in person and, and talk more 
and Anne uh, and Aska, thank you so much for including me. This was a really important brain exercise for me uh, after being in mental lockdown for four months. So thank you and uh, thank you, Ree Morton. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Ree. Okay. Yeah, this, this was like a dream for me. I mean, I, I love the work so much and, um, and it's so nice that like Evan kind of introduced me to the work actually and so it's really, I mean, I'm just so happy to get to talk to all of you and so thrilled to be asked um, to talk about it, her work. And she is, she's just an amazing artist and will, I mean, I think the work still seems so current and influential. So, um, and it seems like good, I mean, it does seem like good medicine right, right now. Mm -hmm too, you know. <laughs> yes, here, here. Thank you all again. One final congratulations to Kate Craxon and to our very own Jamila James for her excellent installation of this work and care and attention to it. And thank you all for your insights. Take care, everyone. Good night. <laughs> Farewell. It always feels funny to hit that leave button. Someone else do it first. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye. Oh, bye, you guys. Bye. Thank you bye. So great to see you all. I don't to, like, I don't know, do this. <laughs> it was great. So great. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Oscar. <laughs> <laughs>